Yes. All right. So now it's our grind. We don't pay our speakers. They pay us with their time. So that's why at the count of three, you're going to stand up. We're going to give him the warmest rockstar applause. One, two, three. Please give it up. Thank you very much, Javi. Oh, yeah, we need some water. Oh, oh. <laughs> that was dangerous. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> he almost tried to kill us. Great. How many times have you been welcomed by a flying bottle on stage? First time. First time. How about <laughs> as a rock star? First time. Like this, first time. Great. Thank you very Thank much you. for your cooperation. <laughs> Tell us a little bit like, about the first time you actually spoke on stage at an event. We were commenting on this, and I found it like, really funny. What happened, and how was it? Where was it? Well, it was literally right when we started the company. And you know, when you start the company, you know kind of what you're going to do, but not really what you're going to do. So you go into this stage, right, and they tell me, no, don't worry about it. It's a very, you know, superficial talk. Long story short, I think it was in the, um, in the Mobile World Congress, and there was 500 and people, 550 people in that room. It was my first talk ever. Not bad. I, I, I literally shot on my pants. I feel like kind of like the underdog here. You've spoken at the Mobile Congress. Why are you doing here? I know, right? <laughs> I know. Now, how, about, how about this? This is a little bit one of the things I wanted to comment about with you. And, and the conversation is going to be also about, OK, there was a slide about, yeah, we can have this slide. Because um, you guys have chosen Barcelona. And uh, you are vetting very, very, very strong for Barcelona. But let's talk before that, before we're getting there, let's talk about Startup culture, startup scene, all about this, fake it till you make it thing. What part are we liking more? What part are we liking yet, more, uh, less? So kind of like what you spoke there. Do you think you actually deserve there? Did you have imposter syndrome or something like that? Again, again, so the parts that I liked and the yeah. parts that I didn't like. Yeah, exactly, about the startup culture. In Barcelona specifically? Yeah. Just in general? Just in general. So look, I mean, what I love about the startup uh, 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 culture, you should say, is that you go out there to try to solve problems that a lot of people have, right? And you, and you try to solve these problems with really smart, smart solutions. So I really like the empowerment that startups bring to people. All of a sudden, you can go into a room with two or three smart individuals, and you can create an amazing company or an amazing solution for a real problem in the world. Mm -hmm. So from that side, I'm, I'm completely hooked. I, this is why I do it. And then from the other side, of course, you have a, a, maybe the not so great parts. It's depending on the path you take. Let's say if you take you know, the the self-funded path, the VC mm -hmm. path, the crowdfunded path, depending on the path you take, the, the journey is very different. So, and I think, you know, for me in the whole time, it's been a bit of a struggle to be able to grow almost artificially so much just to get to numbers because that's the path we chose. So basically having to accept some things that don't feel natural as a first time entrepreneur, for me, you know, it took time for me to accept and for me to understand, I would say. Let's talk about the idea, because it seems to me like you started the idea while you were working at Booking.com. So you discovered a need that was there. So kind of yeah. like, I feel like the idea came to you. You didn't go to search for an idea, right? So can you explain a little yeah, bit how the yeah, process was? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was at Booking.com, right? And um, there was this huge demand for people trying to book with their corporate emails, right? Just going through the normal platform. And the reality is that the platform was not, was not built for normal consumers, for normal business travelers. It was mm -hmm. built for consumers. And just to make it super simple, business travelers want to prepay, right? And, and at Booking, everything is postpaid, so you pay when you get to the hotel. And to change that infrastructure is, is a huge, huge challenge. So I knew that they were never, I mean, they told me specifically that they would never go in that direction. Why? The, the, the market is 1.3 trillion. They had, cap, they had captured up to that point maybe 9%. They had 91% still to capture. And they said, why in the world would we do something else other than that that we can do really, really good, which is release your travel? So that for me kind of was like the check mark where I said, OK, this is not going to happen here. It's going to happen somewhere else or me. And I left it there. And I left it there for, for a bit. And what happened? When did you pick it up again? Because that, it, it, felt, it feels like you had an idea that was waiting for you. It came to you. And it was proven, actually. So you could say, like, well, Booking.com has already got this data. It's not me like testing an MVP. Well, it was right? proven that it was proven that companies were trying to use consumer tools yeah. to solve their business travel problems. So it was clear that there was something missing, right? Yeah. Why do people come into Booking.com and not to Booking.com for business, for example? Yeah. Right. So <laughs> there was a clear need, 
but in my mind, also being within Booking, I knew how complex this need was. Mm -hmm. and, and then one of the things that threw me away was, man, we're in 2018, well back then in 2015, it's, I, can't, I, could, I could not believe that there was such a big segment in travel that was uncatered. Mm -hmm. For me, that was like, I must be missing something. Like, Did you feel the call of duty? Like, no, I need to do it. I was Yeah, like I felt that, like I need to do it. Yeah. But I also was very reluctant to do it because I thought there must be something in the making already that I'm not aware of, right? It's a big world. Yeah. Long story short, uh, I, got, um, I got an opportunity. So they didn't do it, a booking. Of course. And I, got a, I was doing this project there, blah, blah, blah. I got an opportunity to go to South America to do a similar project for, for another online travel agency. But of course, I had a non-compete, so I had to wait for a year mm -hmm. uh, to go to this new company. And in that time, as you might get to know me, I'm quite I, I'm hyperactive. So I said, shit, what do I do for a year, right? Uh, <laughs> so I literally put myself into a co-working space, and I would go there from 8 in the morning to, let's say, whatever, 6. And I started writing, writing the business plan for, for a business travel platform. And I said, you know what, whatever, I'm just going to write this, do a prototype, you know. <clears throat> and if I, get, if I get two things, if I get partners mm -hmm. and funding, maybe I won't do the job. Long story short, I pitched it once uh, to a few guys from Booking. They told me to fuck off. I pitched it twice. They told me to fuck off. And then the third time, we met for the birthday of one of them. This guy was the B2B director uh, at Booking.com. So he had B2B experience, which is what I wanted. Yeah. Right? So I went to his birthday. Uh, we met in Ibiza. Uh, um, and, and my birthday present was pretty much a new version of the business plan he yeah. had before. Yeah. And, and, and my birthday present was like, dude, here is the business plan. And this is why you should quit your job and your department. That was before the party or after the party? This was actually, we didn't party that much. We, we drank I, a lot of wine. No, of course, if you found the one parties there, yeah. Uh, <laughs> how did he react to receiving such a, you know, extraordinary gift? You know, I, I think I said it with such a conviction that I, he, I think he knew that he had to at least read it. Just read it. Just right? read it. Just fucking read it. Yeah. And then he read it, and then I could immediately see how his perspective just switched. This was my first one, right? Your so first one, yeah. I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be, maybe this is important for you guys, I didn't want to be CEO from second one. Like the last thing I wanted was to be CEO. I wanted to be in the kitchen, building stuff, getting dirty, working with the teams. That's my passion. That's what I do, right? Yeah. So, um, so my goal was, let's find a CEO, but I'm also not a technical guy. So let's also find a technical guy. Mm -hmm. And to find these two things, not only a technical guy, a CEO guy that has, you know, the experience, the time, and the money, Quite a few, and they have to believe in your idea, quite a few stars have to align for that to happen. Mm -hmm. And that's why I did it. So when those two things came into place. And how did you convince the others? Because obviously living uh, like a well-paid job, like working at booking.com, which is, you know, it's not precisely a startup. So yeah, it's yeah. difficult to leave the management positions. How did you convince them just by the business plan? Or did you actually play the CEO role of having to charm them into joining you? Well, it's it's quite easy. It's quite easy. Why? Because if you tell them, look, guys, uh, so yeah, you're amazing. You have an amazing role at Booking.com. You're going to be there. You, you know, you're the B2B director. Let's say you make 150 grand. Let's say you're super frugal mm -hmm. and you're able to save 80 grand a, a, you know, a year. Yeah. It's going to take you 12 years to get to the million to retire, right? That's a good argument, yeah. Versus we do a really, really crazy thing. And maybe you'll be drinking piña coladas way sooner, and plus you will solve something in the world. So, duh. Feels you compelling, know? yeah. Gotcha. So, because one of the things I, I was asking about this, and I was making so much emphasis, because there's a lot of people trying to recruit and hire, and I need a CTO, and I need this, and I need that. It's really fucking difficult, it's, right? It's the, um, most, it's the most difficult thing. But one of the, th the cool things is that they think they're going to meet somebody like in Plaza Catalunya or something. Sometimes you need to pitch your asses off to really high profile people like he did, right? So what other, what other advice would you give to people who need to pitch somebody like a really high profile at a corporate? So, hey, I want this guy at Vodafone. I want you to be my CEO, for instance. So one thing, try to avoid friendships as much as you can. All right because that will go south in 99% of the cases. You think, oh man, this guy is my buddy, I love him to death. You know, hanging out with somebody and working with somebody is two different worlds, right? And specifically if you go into a business. So I would really, really advise that you, if you really appreciate that friend, that you really think it twice. That would be one. The two would be that you really, uh, meeting somebody once is not enough. You have to meet them at least 
a couple of weeks. Yeah. You literally have to date with them. Guys, you're getting married. Hmm. This is the way you have to see it. You are getting married to this person. I mean, you're signing more documents than when you get married, and there's, well, it depends how you see it. There's a lot in stake, you know, equally like in a marriage. Hmm. But, <laughs> Maybe but, more. Eh. Yeah. But, um, I so, um, so I think like, for example, in my case, I, I think two things are important. One is really getting to know the individual, and literally it's like, it, it needs to be the most hardcore interview you have done in your life. Hmm. In your life, like assessments, interviews, you gotta have references from this person, everything, right? Because you're gonna get married. And then the other side is, if you find an amazing person, you have to be quick. So in my case, uh, my, my co-founder and CEO, um, Avi, this guy had just sold the company to Booking. So, so he had kind of like the check mark already in his, in his backpack that he had sold the company. And I knew that for me that was, was, was amazing. Mm -hmm. So I really wanted to get this guy. I was right now in the south of Argentina with my, with my girlfriend and, uh, uh, and son. And we were basically, you know, in the, what you call, Perito Moreno. Mm -hmm. I hear that Avi is just literally, I get the email that this guy is now open to talk. So I said, okay, I could either finish my trip and lose this or fly back now to Buenos Aires, talk to this guy. <clears throat> I talked to this guy and I said, okay, how quick can you meet? And he said, look, pretty quick because I have a full team of people that I could take with me. This was Saturday. Monday, I was in Barcelona and we spent every single meal together for 10 days in a row. Not bad. I was going to say, because so, one of the things, no, that's, it's pretty impressive. So, you know, so I, I'm not saying everybody needs to fly over the ocean to kind of get somebody. But it's great. It will, it, will, it will get you to places. One of the things is when we're pitching these high-profile people, um, they have a lot of compensations. They have a lot of comfort. They have you know, big, big salary. So probably they're not the right kind of first-time entrepreneurs who would just go without a salary for two years, eat ramen, and all that shit, right? How did you do it? How, what, what were your initial conditions? Did you have a salary from the start? Did no. you bootstrap it? So the conditions were, let's stay away from funding as long as we can yeah. until we have something to prove. So we funded it ourselves. I took yeah, a, initial investment, right? I took a, yeah. so we didn't even do family or friends. We did ourselves. OK. So um, only fools, right? Huh? Only fools. Only fools. Only, only fools. fools. No family and friends. We yeah. went pretty much all in for, for, our, uh, uh, for what we had. And yeah. that was it. We went all in. We, we got three or, two, you know, three or four guys. We built the first MVP for eight months. They told us it sucked. <laughs> After talking to 200 companies, so we went back. And then we pivoted, and then we built something in four months, which is what took us to where we are today. Speaking of um, that MVP, right? Yes. We were, I was slightly commenting on the fact that most startups seem to engage in this fake it till you make it attitude. A lot. Yeah. Your MVP was quite far from being complete while you were selling it, right? Yeah, so yeah. is that the case? How, how was the process? So look, like... In a startup, right? Like, well, you can admit it. We're going to cancel it out the video. Don't worry. <laughs> so imagine in a startup, you have, you have a, a, a room full of resources, right? A, a, a employees, whatever you want to call it. And every day that passes is, is one year or less that you have, right? So, and the only way you're going to accelerate your learnings and your final, let's say, your final real MVP that potentially is going to have a good market fit is to talk to customers as fast as possible. Yeah. Right? It's, I know it sounds like common sense, but a lot of startups don't do it. They wait, they build, and then they go. Don't wait. Build as little as you can and go, even yeah. if it's horrible. And, and believe me, like, actually learning how to say I'm sorry becomes a, becomes a really easy thing. Like, say I'm sorry, it doesn't work yet. And then you come back again in two weeks, I'm really sorry. And then, um, but to make the long story short, um, what we did, uh, we, had, um, we had a decision to make when we pivoted. We said, okay, we're going to become a full-blown Travel agency for companies. What does that mean? They need to be able to book flights, hotels, trains, expense management, uh, call centers, departments, travel policies. Name it, we have to have it. All right? Shit. All right, so, so how do you start? What's the hmm. first thing you do? So what we did is that we said, okay, right now the companies that we're targeting, they're going to two different places. They're going to Skyscanner to book flights, and they're going to Booking.com to book hotels. So how about we make that easier for them, and we just put these two types of inventory in one place, not with the resources that we have, right? We have yeah. to like find the minimum we could do. So we do that, we, get, we go to five customers and they said, ah, this is nice. Okay, so that was kind of like year one, right? And then in that year one, we said, okay, but now, now what do you want? Okay, now we want to be able to book everything, right, in, in real time. And we said, okay, we go back, did a bit of 
research and we figure out that to do this, we were gonna need six months of the entire team coding for this team to be in real time hmm. and we just couldn't wait. So we said, okay, let's build the front end. Imagine you would go to Skyscanner today, literally. It looked that, that way almost. You go to Skyscanner today, you would say, I'm gonna go from Barcelona to London. You would see your flights. You would enter your, uh, your, your payment details, your, you know, your traveler information, all that stuff. You would click on pay and then you would get a confirmation. And in that moment, what actually happened was simply an email was created that went to my inbox saying, <laughs> Alex wants to book, be quick or the price might change, right? <laughs> <clears throat> and then we did that for three months while so we were building. You were actually stuff. losing money then. A lot. Yeah, wow. A lot, <laughs> A lot. but it was, we were losing less money than what we were learning. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, yeah, there was an opportunity cost. That so exactly, so, so, we did it, it, yeah. um, so we did that for three months uh, on shifts of three hours and it was probably the most painful part of the, of the, of the ride until now, I would say from a, from a physical standpoint. But man, like all of a sudden three months we had gone from a completely different model to this, yeah. to having customers, data, insights, uh, and I think it was by far the, the, the best thing we could have done. So what was your biggest fuck up in that process? Did you really fuck up with somebody that said like, oh Jesus, we lost a ton of money here? There was like some Ma big fuck up there in terms of technology or? A massive. Yeah? Massive. Can, you, can you tell us a little bit? Maybe not say the name of the client, but? No, I won't say it. No, I won't say names, but it was me. It was ah. me. I, I massively fucked up. Um, yeah. So I had just started the company. I was, I don't know how to start. Um, so I was advising this company in South America where I was supposed to get the job. And I told them, hey, guys, uh, I'm not going to take the job, but I'm going to advise you, you know, kind of like to make it up. And, yeah. and I'm going to go to Barcelona to start this company. So in the first three months, we put the team together and we were building the MVP. Yeah. Me in Buenos Aires a few weeks, and then so I would work during the day, give the consulting, and in the night I would uh, you know, go, with the, go with the developers, we would do the sprint planning and the whole thing for Travel Park. So one of those nights that we're working with them, my only designer tells me, I quit. Yeah, nice. Yeah. And it's the only guy I have, right? Yeah. And, and I'm like, oh. I'm like, all right. Bienvenido, ciao, there's the door, thank you very much. Uh, uh, you know, life goes on, and then there's two options what you can do. You can either like scramble and try to get a designer as fast as you can. Yeah. Smart decision. Or do it yourself. Or do it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that coming. <laughs> so what did I do? I locked myself for a weekend. Yeah. Literally, and I learned how to use Sketch. Nice. I, like I basically learned how to use even Photoshop. I even learned. Yeah. I In learned a weekend. How to use all the yes. Wow. It was taking me a it lifetime, was but yeah. <laughs> Well, you can imagine how the designs came out, right? Yeah. And we built it. So, dude, right. like that, that product, I still have it. But, but it's, that's not a fuck up. How is that a fuck up? It's I a like, fuck up because I should have, like, you know, when you're an entrepreneur and, yeah. and, 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 and you're like, you're, you're a really small group of people, you really have to understand, okay, there's some things that you really should hustle and do yourself, yeah. All right. and there's some things that you shouldn't. How about the fuck up where you actually have to say, I'm sorry to a client? Is there any can you can oh, share? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just one, I mean. Um, so I would say uh, one of our biggest customers that we had, uh, let me think, the best one. Um, Your co-founders are not watching, don't worry. No, no, no. Your investors are not well, it's watching. Not me. I'm, I'm not yeah. sure if it was me. Yeah. But basically, <laughs> to make a long story short, we had a group reservation for a company in Singapore. Yeah. And this was like their yearly, their yearly thing, right? Their yearly, how do you say it? Like uh, a retreat? Yeah, yeah. yearly retreat. Yeah. We booked the wrong month. Oh. Dates are always a problem. And you always. Yes. Always. We're building a time zones, dates, you know, we developers, make, we don't we're understand this. We're gonna make that shit bulletproof from now on, I promise. But uh, Oh wow. But um, what did you do? Uh, well the thing is that we realized, you know, if we would have realized two days before, fine. You realize when these people are in the airport, there's no tickets for them. Oh. They're not going anywhere. It's pretty painful, yeah. So that that's probably what the biggest uh, because then you have to like it's, it's so you called them? Huh? It was actually you calling them on how oh, yeah, you yeah. solve that situation. Oh no, it was it was me, it was us, like it was it was the leadership and and, and, and we but it happens and, and we just have to move on and learn from it. All right, let's go back to your team and how you settle in Barcelona because you guys are very vocal about being in Barcelona, right? We know Barcelona is the best city in the world, but we've got some problems. <laughs> we've got some problems and we miss, we must talk openly about it. What I like about your blog is that you you published this blog post a few months ago that was like, hey, you know, pros and cons of headquartering in Barcelona, yes. which I found like really interesting. 
because it was a nonpartisan view. It's not like, yeah, Barcelona is awesome, you know, it's easy to hire and like it's cheap and it's there's this and that. But it was pretty well balanced. So how is your experience? And in hindsight, would you have would you do it again if you had to, you know, create another company? Would you do it in Barcelona? So I for sure wouldn't do it in Barcelona anymore. I'm just All right. <laughs> <laughs> because of because of the taxes, right? It's exactly, because yeah. of the taxes. No, um, I would totally do it in Barcelona again. Great. So, um, I guess the question is why we're here, right? Yeah. Why we're here? Okay. Good things and bad things. We've got a few people that are not from Barcelona tonight, that they're coming from abroad, so it's good for, you know, we need to attract some business, but give them the full perspective. So, the good thing is that up until, let's say, a few years ago, Barcelona was always a kind of a bit, a, a bit off, off the radar, I would say. You know, you had yeah. Berlin, you had London, you had Paris, Amsterdam, these people were, these hubs were just growing. And Barcelona was there, just under, under the radar, which was amazing, yeah. because you could get, you know, really cheap rent, you can get, you know, a, a bit of a cheaper labor force, et cetera. But that has changed now. You know, now Barcelona is getting bombarded with, uh, with, with great companies, which I think is fantastic. I don't care if now talent is cost a bit more. No, but that means that we have a way better ecosystem with way better talent, and so, so all in all, I think Barcelona has everything it takes to become a wonderful ecosystem. They got the infrastructure, they have the talent, they have the, you know, the, the, the investments now coming in, so, so the capital. Yep. I would say the only thing that really Barcelona um, has to wake up is in the bureaucratic side of things. All right. I think that uh, uh, if in, you... In what sense is that, well, I mean, you know? It's super simple, right? Like if you want to be in, 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 the, in the main stage of of startups uh, uh, or become a major, a major hub, then shit, things need to happen overnight. Not three weeks, yeah. not three months, not one w overnight. You go to a company today, you want to do a startup in the US, you can open a startup in 24 hours with the yeah. exact same. Here, you need to run through like five loops. Well, I mean, like three years ago, they completely shut down Uber overnight. That was a good example of being effective, right? But it's probably not the way you would have put it. In what ways has it actually been super positive in your growth? Like, let's say, in one particular area, like financing or hiring or finding, you know, I would the say right management team, things like that? I would say it's a combination of, of both. So, yeah, we found, a, a, we've been able to get really, really good talent. Yeah. So that's, that's for us super important. We've been able to build really good relationships with, with most Spanish banks, yeah. also based in, those based in Barcelona, which for us is quite important because we have quite a bit of an intense cash flow thing that we have to manage, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so for us, it's very important. And, um, and I would say that, that those two things are, are, are like the, the things that really, really help us here. How about, because one of the things, so Barcelona has always been pretty famous for to build a startup, but not to grow it. If you need to look for like more advanced investment, then you go elsewhere, past Series A, things like that. Do you think it's still like that, or you can no, do it from Barcelona? Not no, anymore, no, no. right? I mean, what's your opinion? I think I think that uh, myth has been now broken, right? Uh, yes, Great. in the beginning, uh, right? It actually depends on who you talk to, which investors you talk to. A few, but if they come specifically from the UK, I yeah. did notice that they were quite keen in the early days for us to be based in the UK. Yeah, but once we told them that's not going to happen, uh, 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 and then we went to Barcelona. As of that moment, <coughs> they kind of just accepted it, and from there on, we've taken it all uh, um, along a lot more investors. And to be honest, mm. the only thing they uh, uh, they will they might tell you is, hey, I would rather invest in a Delaware company, so that so the holding of the company yeah. might not be in in, um, in Spain, but in the U.S. Um, but why did that happen? Why did they want you to be in London? Why? You know, you're not fintech, so you're not, no, or either like trust, gambling, things like that. I think they it's trust, a matter of trust, not regulations, right? It's a matter of the trust in the system. Yeah. Can, can they really trust the, the legal system, the banking system? And they just feel, it's not that they don't trust it. They just already know that they know their system's already so good. Yeah. They'll be like, why would we even, you know, when you, when you invest in a startup, as you know, every percent of risk yeah. that you can take away, you'll take it away. And if you can easily tell if, uh, an entrepreneur, dude, base your company in London instead of Spain, and they accept, then there's a little bit risk for in their head. Yeah, exactly. In their head, exactly. right? But I think now that you see companies like ours and, and others that are raising substantial capital, yeah. <coughs> I think that's changing. I mean, we, we were oversubscribed for every single round. And, and in every single round, we told them that we were in Barcelona. And they came here. Yeah, I mean, Index, Excel, Atomico, they're bringing people over and over just to kind of like get the feeling. Uh, 
even some of them are looking to open offices here, which I think is a yeah. really good, a really good idea. And Target Global is opening an office in Barcelona. So you know, more and more international investors will fucking. How will that affect you? Not only in terms of funding, but in terms of more like competition. Do you see any other small travel pair coming up and then taking away your jobs ah. and your your business model? No. No, it's, and I don't say that in an arrogant way. I say that yeah. in a way that the market is so big. Yeah. We're, we're in a $1.3 trillion market. One. Two, what we're building is extremely complex. Yeah. So game on. That sounded like Booking.com when they told you, like, we're not going to build this, right? So it's extremely complex. And, yeah. and so, so, so first of all, to, to do it, it takes a lot of, lot of uh, investment. Yeah. And B, man, like even if they, if somebody would come and they would build, they would build travel park number two right next to us. Yeah. There's thousands of thousands of thousands of companies around the world, hundreds yeah. of thousands, right? So there's space for everybody. The last thing I, I imagine booking after 15 years, they had yeah. captured nine percent. Yeah. Like, you know, the day I, the day I will I will really uh, uh, start worrying on competition is when somebody has one person in the entire industry has more than five percent. At the moment, nobody has it. Let's talk about product, because you mentioned this a few, a few times over the MVP and the evolution of the platform. What do you think have, have been your key insights or what have you brought that have completely changed the, the game or have you had like hockey stick, bro, things like that in terms of product? What have you contributed the most? You know, I think for us, in our case, it's really uh, having <coughs> the, the complexity in, travel, uh, in building Travel Perk is that you, you must imagine people compare you to Expedia. You go to Expedia, yeah. everything is built. You can reserve a, a seat, you can, res, you, know, you can do priority boarding, you can do everything. Yeah. So this is the Expedia uh, plane, and this is a travel perk plane. We might not yet have the seats and yeah. the baggage, so we're building that shit while we're flying, That's trying great. to compete with these guys. <coughs> and um, so it's been really, uh, uh, um, I think for us, it's just the biggest needle mover is when we are able to be in parity with existing Platform. solutions for consumers. Great. Once we, which, and now we're pretty close to that. Now that we have the verticals built and you can do the normal standard stuff that you would do, now is the moment where we start, when we start thinking real product innovation, real growth, you know, growth stuff. Mm -hmm. But until now, it was just simply coming into parity with the, with the basic tools that people need to book travel. Which is, Which is crazy complex. Super complex ability. because these, these people have been around for, for years and years and you're, you're building something while you're flying, right? And so one of the things is you need to be really quick, not only at executing, but you need to be really fast at prioritizing oh. and doing it the right way. How do you prioritize these Weekly. features? Weekly. Weekly. Like we literally, everything goes through the fire test on a weekly basis. Yeah. We just change it right now to a bi-weekly basis because it yeah. was a bit too much. But if you've got like 200 tasks for 200 features clients one which one do you pick the first like the one with most demand or <laughs> what we do is it's basically by potential build all right? the things no no, no. yeah I, I stand in the morning with a with a bathrobe in front of everybody yeah and i say gentlemen and ladies no <laughs> and no 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 it's it's really simple we basically aggregate these requests by by the customers and, yeah. and potential gmb and that's mm -hmm. that's what goes to the top yeah well, and um so yeah, so it's a balance between the, what the most want and then maybe some quick fixes or quick, quick value that we can deliver that maybe nobody asked for, but we can do it very easily. So it's a balance between these two things. Can somebody just unlock this? Where is Carlos? <laughs> <laughs> just ran out of battery or something. No really? worries. We can continue like this. No, because one, it, it's one of the challenges, right? So um, me as a developer, I've seen this and the client just wants this and this because a client has requested this. Like how many clients have actually requested this feature? like. One, but it's a very important one. So what would you prioritize, like bigger clients, or which brings you into another set of different problems, or smaller features, but with more, but with bigger, more yeah, with a bigger demand? What, which one do you build first? Because if you start always, building the big ones. For us, yeah. always the, the, other, the other side. All right, so the smaller ones. Always. Yeah. Always, I mean. Because otherwise you depend on a big client. No, I mean, exactly. Like at the, at the stage that we're in right now, we. Yeah. Um, it's all right, yeah, all again, yeah. Okay. So at essentially we are right now, we don't have yet then enough resources to go on and do one-off projects and be like, yeah. okay, for this one big Coca-Cola company that's coming to us, we're not going to stop, get a team of development. Per we don't do that right now. Yeah. Right now, we got to really be super strict. To be honest, maybe a little bit of advice that I could give is one of the things that you really have to learn, at least in SaaS, mm. is to say no. Yeah. Like, you can have companies saying, hey, you know, I have a 
50 million budget in travel spend this year, do you want it? And you say no. Yeah. You say Sounds no. difficult, but it's the right way to you go, say no, right? Because you know that you're not going to serve them how you're supposed to serve them. A. B. There's plenty of solutions for that segment. Mm -hmm. So why would you compete into that segment? So if you have got this super big, huge ass uh, client and you end up being a prostitute for this client, right? Because they're paying you big, bu big budget and say like, I'm your biggest client. If I go away, uh, what happens? Things like that, right? So it's better to serve the smaller clients. Yeah. Um, that brings me to, so how's the distribution? Like, do you really have one of the biggest clients that's out there or is it pretty distributed in like really small accounts? How, how does it look like in terms of? So I would say our, um, our target market, I would say are the likes of medium-sized companies, yeah. right? Uh, uh, so maybe from, I would say our sweet spot is between 100 to, to 3,000 uh, employees. Yeah, pretty much like everybody here. Yeah, but uh, pretty much. Pretty much. You can pretty have much. lots of customers. And, and then tonight. we also cater for the smaller companies that want yeah. to self-service. We also Great. have that. Great. Uh, um, but it's basically we're trying to take the small and medium-sized businesses and small enterprises. I would put under small enterprise maybe, let me think, a company that we can all think of. A company that has about three to five thousand employees. Yeah, that's a small. That's not a. That's not a, a medium-sized company. That's a. That's a small enterprise. How about because one of the things that really strikes me is um, now a lot of startups are going nuts to find product people. It's like we don't have product people in Spain. We've never had product people. We've had project managers. Product people is kind of like super American, maybe UK. You can find product people, not Europe. We've traditionally had project managers. How do you find product people and how important are to your company? Extremely important. They're like, these people are like literally the little CEOs. Do you train them or do you hire existing product people? I mean, for now, for us, we've hired, we, we, we did a mix, right? So we hired yeah. three rock stars, one, one learner, and one very junior. Yeah. Just to mix it well, right? And um, so for us, the formula uh, that has worked uh, is all of them need to have an engineering background. Yeah. And, and that just makes the day-to-day -day work so much easier. They can talk the same language with engineers, et cetera. And, in, and we do crave for people that, uh, that are very sorry, obviously, with data, but yeah. also with, uh, with consumer experiences. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the vision that we're trying to go is, is it's a consumer product for businesses. But it should feel like a consumer product. Mm -hmm. So I would say, uh, uh, until now, the formula has been, uh, has been this, just looking for people that have you know, engineering backgrounds, existing uh, experience managing, um, ideally SaaS products and, or e-commerce, and, and very, and very data-driven. If you have these three, the door is open. Wanted to wrap it up with a couple of quick questions for you, Javi, then we open the floor for more interesting questions from you, from everybody. First one is, what's the company culture like? What do you expect from an employee at Travelberg? So I like my coffee with, um, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> No. You can uh, expect a lot of jokes at Travel <laughs> Park that we can... <laughs> no, um, you know, guys, I, 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 when, when, when we started this thing, if there was one thing that was clear to me was, the, it's, just, it's just an idea. Like, me and the idea were, were nothing. So yeah. it was very clear to me that I was going to need a very big group of people to do this. Yeah. And um, so that's kind of like we try to come, treat the company, right? Like, it, it's not about me. It's about us building the product. So it's very, so it's very bottom up. It's like... We have a problem, I'm not going to solve it for you. You tell me. So I really, really, really listen, I would say. I would say we all in the company listen a lot to each other. We're extremely ambitious. So it is a very fast-paced environment, a, a, a extremely driven and, a, 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 and focused, I would say. Um, so I would say those are the things that, that keep us going, right? So we're, we're focused, a focused culture. We have three goals for the entire company. So it's yeah. not complicated. It's just this, this, and that. And, um, and then everybody, what we do is that we, we, we make sure that everybody understands how their contribution is getting to those numbers, right? And if they feel that they control and are part of this, yeah. then it all comes together. But if I just say, hey, do this, then, you know, for the obvious, for the, you know, for the, you, you might imagine that it just breaks. So, so very bottom up, very open minded, uh, very fast paced. And we truly believe in small iterations, small iterations. We don't go mm -hmm. out and start planning big bangs and big releases. And no, we do a lot of small fixes, which is go very fast and small. Great. One of the last questions is, I'm going to fire at you some words. You need to reply with the first word that comes to mind. Only one, all right? You ready for this? Yes. Drink. It's going to be. All right. 
So first one, startups. Cool. Investors. <laughs> not so cool, that's not a word. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Barcelona. Incredible. San Francisco. Just one word? Yes. Shit, cold. <laughs> In August, right? Yeah. So, wind, wind. All right. B2B. The place to be. Oh, you can't yeah, say it's that. Yeah, it's free line, it's free line, it's free It's all right. Now you can do it, you can do it. B2B. Um, service. Booking.com. Machine. Developers. Kings. Startup grind. Incredible. <laughs> Very good. All right. And the last one, there's a lot of space for the last one. Everybody has got a useless superpower. Not useful superpowers. We useless. don't care about it. Useless. Something you do exceptionally well, but it's like, why the fuck do I know this for, right? So, like, you know, locking the car, walking away 100 meters, it's like, did I lock the car? That's a pretty useless superpower. Or mixing the... But that's not a superpower. That's it's, a... it's a useless superpower, yeah. If you do it exceptionally well, like every day, that happens to me, by the way, yeah. I'm that person. So I would say a useless have a, I would say useless is I know how to juggle bottles, but I don't drink. That's pretty useless. That's pretty useless. Yeah, I mean, because you're not gonna, you know, run out of like jobs. I, can, so. I know how to do that shit, but I don't drink, so it's it's <laughs> it's pretty useless. Give it up for Javi. Thank you very much. Um, all right. You know, this works. We're gonna we're actually a little bit. I didn't know we went that far. You know, take two, three questions. Uh, please be very respectful of other people's time. So uh, just say your name and one question per person, please. And very direct. Like, for instance, you know how this works. I'm Victor with uh, Startup Grind. Javi, I had the pleasure of going to visit your old digs over on uh, Via Gusta, I think. Uh -huh. I understand you got some new places and you were kind of keeping it secret for a while. Uh, can you, are you guys able to share where you are now and whether or not that has impacted the culture? It was a very cool place you used to be. Yes, I was told I can share it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I should yes. have interviewed her, right? Yeah. So we're lucky enough yeah. to be moving now to Torre Akbar. Uh, that's going to be our new headquarters. We've taken uh, uh, four floors and we're going to put a drone in the top to take the people to lunch. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's Torre Akbar, yeah. That's great. And, right. and, yeah, you know, actually, uh, we did a cool thing because people were really, really pissed off, believe it or not, because we're now in Gracia, yeah. and now we're going to there. So the only way to get these people to move, we had to get them little uh, electric scooters. Jesus Christ. So now you will see 180 Startup. scooters in the morning <laughs> going from Gracia to the... Because they're not going to take an Uber, obviously, right? It's going so to be amazing. <laughs> it's going to be amazing. I think we've got some questions over there. Yeah, here. Yep. Okay. Uh, Thank, thank you very much, Javier. It's been amazing and, and the, the, the sharing. Um, so uh, I would like to know if you kept that fuck up client. But since I can only, you know, the, if you kept the client, the, the one from the fuck up. That's but okay. since I can only make one question, I'll do another one, which is, uh, so um, what are those three goals? Can you rebuild, it, rebuild them? Those three goals that your whole team has to identify with? He made that up, clearly. <laughs> you mean in terms of the things that are... Uh, yeah, you said us? like there's three, th three things. The, 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 but what was the context? I forgot by now. Uh, what, were, what were we talking about? Like... Uh, How many goals are? Huh? Ah, so I would say, you know, we're extremely uh, bottom up. I, I would say we're extremely... I'm not sure if I'm going to use the same words, but it's what it is. So we're extremely bottom up. So we really empower yeah. the people to become part and to, for them to understand why, it, why is this the lighthouse and what are you doing to contribute to that and how is that really important, right? And, and mm -hmm. so we give people that, we give them a voice, uh, uh, we, we allow mistakes. I would say that's, that's extremely important. And, uh, and overall, we're just a very intense, high-paced bunch of people that are really ambitious and want to build stuff. Uh, 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 but it's very low-key. I mean, if you see any video, you'll see that we're a very uh, group of, of, of very friendly people and very smart trying to build somebody that nobody has built before. Great. It was different words, but I hope I got you the message that you wanted. I was very accurate. Hi, I'm Atman from Belgium. First time, right? Yeah, yeah. that's right, Alex. <laughs> uh, I would like to know how would you hire um, developers 
and what did you learn as mistakes uh, from the past in the hiring process? Thank you. Um, so we have a pretty uh, uh, set framework that we use for most roles, including developers. And there what we do is that we have basically a preliminary interview just to make sure that we're on the same page, you know, do you like me, do, you, do I like you? Once we cross that, we um, tend to start off with a, with a test, with a, with a coding test that we do to them. And, and then if that is passed, then we invite them in-house uh, to do a day of interviews, some, some interviews, and then some are also practical tests that we, that we do you know, live during the day. And, and then, the, but that day is already mostly, okay, it's a little bit to go deeper into the technical expertise of the person, but it's mainly for the candidate to really, uh, to, re, to be really be sure that this is what they want in terms of travel work. So it's more like, it's more for them when they come to the office. The stages before are more for us to assess if it's the right person. Great, can we take like one more? Over there. No. All right, if they're quick enough, we can take two. And if it's really, really quick. Really, really quick. <laughs> Yeah, 10 second question, 10 second answer. Okay, thank you. Um, I just had uh, one question. Uh, um, obviously, you're, you're in the news quite a lot with Travel Perk. Uh, you've done this amazing fund this funding round, etc. And I can only assume that lots of people start approaching you from all kinds of uh, uh, directions. And I was just wondering, how do you separate the interesting proposals from the dog shit, and how do you still have time to do your actual job? That's a pretty cool question. But he actually <laughs> told me he filters out a lot of events, and he's here, just saying. So he's right about some things. So, um, so look, one thing that I'm allergic is just the typical sales. I get literally per day 15 different services, applications, hosting. I'm sorry, somebody. I know that this guy's host, but uh, so <laughs> development of, services. I, I get a lot of development services. Yes. Um, so I, what I do, man, I have a bunch, like hundreds of rules in my in my in my inbox. That just send that off to the trash. One, two. I tend to be very selective in the events that I go to, and uh, and and I really just don't go into. I, I'm, I tend to be very polite, and I say, hey, thank you, but that's it. I won't reply three times or four times, but I always reply, and uh, and I'm just very strict with my timeline. I have I have a kid, I have a family, I have a company. I I I really yeah. don't. Yeah, can't can't lose the time. Great, that was a good answer. Let's take the last one, please. Yeah, last one. Sorry. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Cristina, and my question is, I'm here. <laughs> uh, my question is, uh, when you have your idea, and it's your time to pitch it to somebody, and you go to these senior people that are working in a company that is really in the same field, basically, and they probably have connections, how do you feel safe with sharing your idea and not feeling that they can maybe use it, build it, and leave you aside? Thank you. Great question. Um, if there's one thing I can say, is that you know ideas are worth nothing. They're simply worth nothing. And, and, and yes, they could have taken it and maybe gotten together with a few people and, and tried to do it as well. That could have happened, yes. But a big part of the idea is the execution, right? So I, I've never been afraid of that for some reason. I think that to really get to the stage where we are is really a lot of focus and execution. And just by simply hearing a cool, a cool idea, I mean, how many times do you have copycats that fail for that reason because they just don't know how to execute. So I, um, I've actually always been a pretty big advocate of being quite loud with my ideas. Like, I, look, there's very little people in this world that can literally drop everything in that moment and copy your idea, right? So you're gonna gain more from them by them telling you what they think than them from you trying to copy. So I would really, uh, uh, I would really pin, you know, use it as a pinch of salt and, and just go and just scream about your idea. Of course, you know, if you're more advanced and you, and, you have, and you have, of course, code and stuff like that, of course not. But as long as it's just an idea and a deck, scream about it. Great. Well, thank you very much. We've learned quite a lot of things from you, just, you know, how to create a company culture, bottom up, how to sell your product before it's actually complete, how to travel overseas to convince your co-founders and things like that and go the extra mile. So I think that not only for this, you deserve, deserve a really big round of applause, but also you've been probably the only speaker at Sarpra in Barcelona that has said more swear words than I have during this really? So <laughs> fuck yeah. So please give it up. It's pretty remarkable. It's pretty, yeah, I was quite in a low tone today, but like I remember in the first anniversary, second anniversary of Sarpra, I did a keynote like I did, and, 
when I went to, to ask the first question to the, the interviewee, he, was, he said, like, question for the audience, how many times has Alex said fuck during his presentation, right? So <laughs> I'm really happy that we're on the same page, same and I, I, I think that like, we I connected because it, of that. All right, so do you know how this works? If this is your first time, I'm going to explain it. Please don't pile up here. Everybody moves to the next room. There's food, there's drinks, there's amazing people like our sponsors. Just go talk to them, hug them if they smell good, and mingle with all uh, this amazing community that we've got at Barcelona. And we're going to come with Javi in a couple minutes. We need to take the mic up. And thank you very much for coming. Yeah.